Wow, the, the Britney Spears mic. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name's Riley. I'm a type designer, and I run a type foundry called Lost Type. Uh, Lost Type is a, a group of about a, a core group of about a dozen designers that work all the time on new typefaces. And in the past five years, we've worked with over 50 designers to produce a catalog of about 60 typefaces. I'm honored that there's about a dozen Lost Type people here in the crowd right now. Thanks for being here. Uh, to give you a, a rundown, and sort of we, we do things a little bit differently at Lost Type. We work on a, a pay what you want model, where paying for the typefaces at different uh, prices affords you a different tier of rights, essentially. So you can license our typefaces for a 100 user art department. If you're a student, you can get a free copy to try out in your schoolwork. Nonprofit organizations have the opportunity to contact us and license things and so on. Uh, we've had a lot of fun seeing our typefaces go out into the world. I have some examples here. This is uh, some of our fonts on the banners at Disneyland when they opened the Cars amusement park ride. Uh, President Obama used our fonts in his second campaign, specifically his campaigns for LGBT and Latino voters, which I thought was very cool. We've uh, spotted one of our fonts in Sky Mall, so that's how we knew we made it. <laughs> uh, and then that's one of our fonts being 3D printed. Uh, I am really into to type design because it's, it's a combination of all the things I, I really come to love. It's uh, science and art and history and so on. So instead of being here and talking about my own projects, I, I want to talk a little bit about something that was happening right in this very city 45, 50 years ago that changed the way we think about type, the distribution of type, design of type, and so on. So I want to talk about the International Typeface Corporation. Um, they did things differently for their time. and. Uh, in order to give you a sense of exactly what was so unique about them, uh, with the help of S Stephen Coles and Mark Simonson, try to put together some stuff that'll give you a, a depiction of what the industry was like in the years leading up to the formation of ITC in 1970. Um, type's gone through a, a, a series of technological changes. So in the past 100 years, we've seen type go from, from cold handset metal to wood type to uh, hot metal, like the linotype machine where if you're operating it incorrectly, it'll spew molten lead at you. And then to the phototype era, which was a cold process, and obviously very welcome. Uh, and then now digital and screen type. So every time we change technology, the, the typeface has also changed to, to adapt in, in different ways. The linotype, uh, linotype wanted to use Futura on the linotype machine, but they couldn't sort out the licensing, so they created their own version of it called Spartan. It's kind of a different thing, but very similar. Uh, it was born from this need, not being able to get access to what they wanted to use. Um, by the time that the sort of 40s, 50s had rolled around, the technology we used to, you know, to produce type for, for advertising, for instance, said that the, because of the, the focus on making you know, small type look great, there was not so much emphasis in the time on, on large, large headlines for advertising, for instance. So there's an entire generation of lettering artists that were trained to draw large size letter, large size headlines um, to look you know, like they were produced with type. They were essentially drawing facsimiles of Caslon or Century from memory uh, for use in advertising. Uh, if you'd been a lettering artist around this period, this is what you would do every day. Uh, so the phototype machines, machines had been invented largely for, for engraving and so on. The, the technology came from sort of a different industry. And because of advertising and, th and the need for large scale headline uh, type, uh, headline settings, the, the companies like photo lettering sprang up. They were one of the biggest players in the industry. This is the inside of their office, which is apparently just a bunch of dudes in lab coats. Uh, if you worked in advertising here in New York uh, and you wanted to set a headline for an ad, you would call photo lettering and you'd say, I, well, I would, I'd want the word sale in alphabet style and you'd give them an alphanumeric code. They would take a piece of film, load it in the machine. They'd expose the letters you needed according to spacing guidelines on the sides of the letters. They would kern them, maybe use an alternate if they felt that it would, it would spruce up the design, and then they would, they would mail you your, your lettering. Uh, by the t the, one of the most interesting aspects of this is because these machines have the ability to, for instance, use lenses to uh, create new versions of typefaces by optically distorting them to be more condensed or, or extended or uh, create slanted obliques really easily, which wasn't so easy up until this point. Uh, catalogs of type go from being relatively small to dictionary size books. Who here has seen the alphabet thesaurus, the photo lettering alphabet thesaurus? It's like, it's a huge, huge book full of all these variations. A lot of times it'll be a typeface, a style of a typeface, and then variations on, on optically adjusting it. Um, 
So by the time the 60s rolls around, you have a whole bunch of companies in this market who all are, are sort of communicating with the public through the machine that they produce. They, they produce a machine that they want to sell, and it's similar to you know, buying a computer today. Computers, you know, they do different things. Software does different things. The killer app for any one, uh, one of these machines was the catalog of type that they offered. And as you can imagine, if you want to be competitive in this space, you have to support the classic typefaces and something new and fresh. So if you were working on advertising in this era and you decided you wanted to set something in Helvetica, you could turn to your uh, photo lettering alphabet the source and see that there were all these styles of Helvetica that you didn't know existed. Helvetica 4, 5, 5.5, five et cetera. You have this Helvetica diagonal at the bottom that's been turned into a crazy slanted oblique. Uh, if you wanted to use a CompuGraphic machine, you might find that there's no Helvetica at all. There's uh, Helios their version of it. And so what you start to see is that piracy manifests itself as companies creating clones or knockoff typefaces. The terminology gets a little bit weird because sometimes they're literally taking a typeface from one machine and adapting it to theirs by making a clone of it photographically. Sometimes they're redrawing the typefaces to create a facsimile. Sometimes they're redrawing and adding styles that were never there. And sometimes they're legitimately improving upon these typefaces. Uh, this is Helvetica as shown in the Lettering Incorporated catalog, including this bizarre Helvetica Extra Bold, which departs quite a bit. Uh, if you worked with Alphabet Innovations, you'd find Helvetica with a K, Helvetica Common Case, which should probably just be burned in a fire, and Helvetica Flare, which, you know, it's really working, I think, actually. <laughs> I'm surprised Neue Haas Grotesque doesn't have those. They should be canon by now. Um, this is a typeface that I want to talk uh, a bit about. This is uh, Trooper Roman, drawn by Dave Trooper in the late 60s for VGC. Um, the style and story of this typeface, I think, kind of typifies uh, this moment in the industry. Uh, that at the top is one of the only examples I can find of maybe the real Trooper, Trooper Roman in use. Uh, Someone took it and, and added swashes to it because everything had to have swashes. Art Nouveau was a big influence at times. So they adapted swashes on everything, including Helvetica. So someone made Trooper Roman Swash, an unauthorized uh, version, including the very brave capital N Swash. Uh, and then everyone thought this was a, a great idea, so they went, so someone else made Mountie, uh, Alphabet Innovations. Then someone took, took that and cloned that, and actually says in the catalog, similar to Mountie. So they're just embracing it. So that's Moresque. Uh, so that's a clone of a clone of a clone. And then you have Troop from Lettering Incorporated, just cutting off the end of the name. And it looks like they've drawn their own version where it's so high contrast that the exposure from the machine is causing it to turn into a stencil. This is an example that disturbs me in a lot of ways. Uh, one of which is you can, you can kind of see, and these aren't perfect facsimiles to be gauging, but you can see that uh, it's sort of like a game of telephone with the design. As, as it shifts from one clone to another, uh, details of the design are being changed. You can see that over here we have a pretty economical G tail, and then over here it's kind of more flamboyant. The contrast is changing, the termination angle on the top of the A is changing, and so on. So these little details are, are changing from version to version. Uh, in my opinion, this is an example of a typeface that sort of lost its identity through the process of being cloned this way. Uh, and you may be saying, oh, well, I've heard of Trooper Rome before. You're up here talking about it. How, how lost could it really be? Well, uh, in Vancouver, where I'm from, there's a popular uh, coffee shop called Revolver and a design agency there called Post Projects wanted to use this typeface in the identity. And the only version they could get their hands on, although there are a couple now, uh, it was called True Ver with a V. And if you recall, the typeface was named after its creator, Dave Trooper. So in the, in the context of actually you know, disguising a clone typeface, they also obscured the name of the designer, which bothers me. Um, another example of this, uh, you know, uh, Charles Peño founded A-Type I, an or organization specifically based around you know, licensing. Uh, and here's the CompuGraphic clone, P-E-N-Y-O-E. A huge slap in the face. Uh, what would they have called me if I was a designer <laughs> in the 60s? Um, another example is uh, Hermann Zapf. 
um, huge contributions to calligraphy and lettering and type design. And at this point in his career, he was feeling a little bit disillusioned about designing typefaces. He felt that his work was going out and being copied, and, and he wasn't receiving a royalty on that, of course. So in effect, because the industry considered uh, his contributions to be uh, very solid and appreciable, um, that some, something that people could really respect, his, his work was being, uh, in a sense, the industry was punishing him. Uh, so uh, at the top we see Optima, which I think Optima was originally in metal. There's a convincing phototype version at the top from Ryder in Chicago. Then you have Photo Optima by Lettering Incorporated. It's like much, much uh, tighter spacing. I wouldn't be surprised if they changed the drawing somewhat. And then Oracle, just a complete rename in the CompuGraphic catalog. Um, so it's at this point that, that ITC comes along, uh, founded by Herb Luballen, Ed Ronthaler, and Aaron Burns. Uh, each had their own background. Luballen, of course, had been involved in the advertising industry and had recently started uh, Luballen and Burns to do custom lettering and alphabets and so on for, for editorial uh, and advertising clients. Ed Ronthaler uh, had been the, the head of photo lettering whose offices we saw earlier. And he had a lot of expertise in the mechanical and technical side of it, but also evaluating typefaces and building a catalog. Uh, Aaron Burns, shown here, if you speak to anyone who was involved with ITC at all, everyone says Aaron Burns was the soul of the company. Uh, he had worked previously to help uh, assemble catalogs of, of type for, for VGC. And he is uh, an uh, underappreciated graphic designer, in my opinion. If you, if you have a chance at the uh, Herb Luballen Study Center, uh, the archive there has like Aaron Burns Christmas cards, and they just set the bar for me for the rest of my life. He's an uh, absolutely amazing uh, graphic designer. Uh, and so his vision was instead of forming a company and creating a machine and then uh, putting together a catalog of type to sell that machine, essentially encouraging all your best work to be cloned by your peers in the industry and stolen from you, um, their solution was to create a catalog of type, highly curated for quality, and then license that type to any machine manufacturer that might be interested in having it on their equipment. Uh, they would give the art for free to the, to the company that was going to adapt it. They would take it, make their version for their machine, uh, sometimes with interesting changes from one machine to another. Uh, and if they sold anything related to ITC stuff, they paid a royalty fee to ITC, and ITC took 15 to 20 percent of that and gave it to the designers. This is a time in the industry where royalties were not common. Uh, so this was a big shift. And what it really means is that in those same catalogs of type that Mark Simonson and Stephen Coles and I were looking at to pull these clone or knockoff typefaces, you can flip just a few pages and see a legitimately licensed ITC typeface. Uh, the companies that that got the artwork and made stuff for their own machines. They were called ITC subscribers. Uh, there are clones of ITC typefaces. Don't kid yourself, it's, it's just going to happen. But the, uh, so this is avant-garde, obviously one of the typefaces that is most commonly associated with ITC and with Lou Ballin and, and drawn by Tom Carnese. Um, and this is Avante Gothic. Uh, lettering Incorporated's version. And then, uh, and then I found this ridiculous Frankenstein monstrosity. Uh, Avante Cobble. I think Fred Flintstone worked on this one. Uh, I think one of the, the main like, things these phototype designers were going for was like, let's try this so that no one ever has to again. Um, Ed Bengat had been one of the most prolific uh, artists for, for photo lettering did just ton, you know, that dictionary size book, a huge portion of it is stuff he worked on. Uh, and he had done a lot of mastheads for, for magazines and, and so on and uh, newspapers. And then he became a, uh, a, a type designer for, uh, for ITC. And, and his contributions are similarly very prolific. Uh, to this day, he says that ITC Ben Gat, the typeface named after him, is the one he's most proud of. Um, Zopf design ITC Zopf, the tradition being that your, that your first typeface for ITC be named after you, which I think is interesting. It's a, a company encouraging the designers to embrace themselves and their own personal voice in type design. Uh, I was talking to Roger about Ed Bengat's involvement with ITC, and he said, yeah, uh, you know, Apple licensed the ITC fonts for the laser writer, and it really helped Ed Bengat increase the size of his collection of antique aircraft. 
including a plane once owned by Howard Hughes. So apparently they're doing pretty well for themselves. Um, one aspect of this I think is really interesting is that uh, ultimately this is a moment where a type designer could make a typeface and it'd be released by, by a phototype company and used in advertising that month or that year, which is kind of uncommon in the years leading up to that. We're using a lot of uh, incarnations of, of older typefaces, and this is like we can bring a fresh voice to advertising in its own era. Um, Letter set, a, as, a, as a comparison, perhaps not in, not in a lot of ways, but uh, one, in terms of that immediacy, you're supposed to go to your art supply store, pick up some letter set, put it in your layout, and, and there you go. Um, they structured their company in a completely different way. Uh, they were a, a corporate office with franchise locations in different cities. You could buy a letter set franchise where you would then buy wholesale dry transfer lettering and pens and so on and sell those to your local art supply stores. Letter set took that sale, that wholesale sale essentially from them to themselves as the sale to take the royalty from, which was maybe 5%. So speaking to Alan Haley, who worked with these companies, he said it was not uncommon for a letter set royalty check to be literally cents. Um, the ITC aesthetic is something that's hard to pin down in many ways. I mean, there, there are the obvious qualities of tight spacing, really high X height, and so on. Um, but the, the typefaces, especially in the first few years, have like a wonderfully cohesive quality to them in this certain way. And I think that still proves inspirational to, to type designers even today. Um, apart from the fact that their actual typefaces are in use all around us right now. I would not be surprised if half the people in this room had an ITC typeface installed on their computer. 100% of you will see an ITC typeface before the end of today. So their work is still prolific, prolifically used. Um, and, and similarly, the aesthetic continues to be something inspirational to type designers. Uh, two New York City designers, uh, Kelly Thorne and Spencer Charles, uh, have just started their own studio, Charles and Thorne. And this is a typeface that we're going to be releasing with Lost Type in the coming months. Um, it's, it's an honor to be able to continue to promote New York City type designers. Um, so type design is an industry where we take an awful lot of inspiration from things in the past, aesthetic inspiration from, from old typefaces and lettering, and this is something the research is what we all do. Um, I wonder if similarly we can take inspiration from the circumstances surrounding the creation of these typefaces that we've all come to love and that have had such longevity in the industry. Uh, these qualities here were some stuff that was really important uh, to Aaron Burns. How can we make sure as typographers uh, that the typefaces that we use, the way we're using them is supporting the designers that made them? How can we make sure that the digital typefaces that we love today will be adapted to the next technology by the people that created them? Uh, and as, as I think these are the values that we all should be reminding each other to stick to as the next technological revolution sits on the horizon. Thanks very much.